How has the English language impacted Africans in the West and on the continent's concept of spirituality? Very good. So um, I, I think about this often, even in terms of how the English language is actually rewiring people's brains. And I can speak to both in the United States, but then also to here on the continent. There's a certain grammatical structure in terms of how you would say something. So, for example, some would say, uh, my dinkunim, my dinkunim, which is to say, I have consumed a victory, right? That's to say I was victorious, I conquered. In English, you would say, my wene. <coughs> in English, you would say, um, my ahot, right? Maya hot in like this. This is what Tringlish. So they're using chi part of the sentence. Then they use an English part of the sentence. But grammatically, they're they're structuring how they're saying something in the English language. Because in English, you would say I am hot. So they're using chi for the first part to say Maya to say I have become, and then hot is just the English word. Well, in chi, you would have an entirely different grammatical structure. You would say ahufro deme, which is to say steam has taken hold of me, so it's not I am this thing, you say this thing that exists has taken hold of me, the same thing you would say that cold has taken hold of me, so in English you would say I am cold, so a lot of Ghanaians, especially like in Accra, you know, where Tringlish reigns supreme, they would say, oh, Maya cold, and they're just saying I am, so it's like grammatically their brains have been rewired to think about things, even when they think they're speaking chi, so they're having an entire conversation in chi, but their way of conceiving how a grammatical, a grammatically structured sentence should be has been rewired to how English would say it. So again, and you know, so now let's come directly to your point in terms of spirituality. The first time known, I should say, that the word God was used was in a text called Codex, um, Codex uh, uh, Argentarius, which is referring to the silver book. So this is referring to, you know, uh, a Gothic translation into Germanic language of, you know, the Bible, right? So basically they were looking at Germanic people's tribal deities and they were saying what would best, you know, uh, match with the word, you know, that they have for what would be referred to in other languages as Elohim or anything else. So here you're talking about somewhere around 1,500, 1,600 years ago. This is the first time that the word God appears anywhere in print or is known, you know, at least as we can find it to this day, right? Now, when we're talking about Codus Argentius, this is now basically what I, what I refer to as the equal sign will kill our people because they've taken a Germanic tribal deity and they're now saying that this Germanic tribal deity, unknown before 1,500 or 600 years ago, is the creator of everything that exists. Now, why is that problematic? It's problematic because you have people who are much older who are writing books such as our ancestors in classical Kemet who had their own concept of a supreme being. And typically, to be a supreme being, to be a creator or any creator, it means that there has to be a masculine aspect and a feminine aspect, right? for you to create life every human being who has children at least knows this or who has ever been a child knows this because they know they had a father and a mother so our way of conceiving of this concept of what we now refer to as spirituality was very scientific in the sense that everyone knows that this is the order as it exists now and this is the order as it's always been so you find this in for example in Khamnu. Uh, and that's what we call a Bibitumi headquarters because it has eight sides. But you found this in the place called Khamnu, which literally translates to the place of the eight. So you had Amin and Aminet, that's masculine and feminine hiddenness. You had Nun and Naunet, that's masculine and feminine wetness. You had Kek and Keket, that's masculine and feminine darkness. You had He and Hehet, that's masculine and feminine infiniteness. Now, what are they talking about? They're saying that in the beginning, everything that existed was hidden. It was wet, it was dark, and it was infinite. They're basically describing the womb, right? They're literally telling you that if you understand procreation, then you understand creation. If you understand creation, then you understand procreation. So they're telling you something that is very, very evident. It's self-evident that you know that here you start off with a womb, and then in the creation story, it talks about a mound of soil 
that came up into the womb, which of course represents the phallus. So again, they're going from the known to the unknown. They're going from procreation to creation and vice versa. They're going from creation to procreation. If you understand one, then you can understand the other one. So just to that point, now what happens when they tell you that um, I'm in, I'm in that, noon, now net, ket, 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 he, 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 equals this uh, imaginary white boy called God. Here's a, a white man with a beard who's sitting on a cloud somewhere with a magic wand zapping things into existence by himself. Have you ever seen a man create life by himself? Have you ever seen a man just come out of a forest somewhere with a baby saying, yeah, I just gave birth, I'm so happy. No, that doesn't happen. This means that their story is a lie, right? You know, even in terms of myth and so forth and so on, they basically extracted the woman out of all of the things that they talk about. Of course, we know that the Greeks studied in Kemet, but it tells you something about what goes on. They ingested something, but a lot went on in the stomach acid of the Greeks to the point that when they vomited up, it's no longer what it was before in terms of, and this wasn't just there. You can find the same thing in Unu, <coughs> which is what the Greeks call Heliopolis, because you start off with Atum, that has masculine and feminine aspects. And then from Atum comes Shu, masculine, Tefnut, feminine. From there, you know, you have Geb and Nut, masculine and feminine once again. You have Asara, Set, masculine and feminine once again. You have Setech and Nebethut, which again, masculine and feminine. So this is what the Greeks came to study. But when they go back, you know, they're going to Kronos. They're going to, you know, Zeus. They're going into their supreme God is always going to be a man. Because in their worldview, which deals with diametric opposites, one thing is good and the opposite has to be evil. That's why even in their religions to this day, God is good and then God is counterposed by a devil that's evil. That idea of a devil is entirely foreign to all concepts of black, what we would call spirituality. The idea is that if the supreme being is omnipresent, that means that if something called a devil existed, the supreme being exists inside of that thing that you're calling a devil. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <clears throat> The idea is, again, going from this idea of masculine and feminine. But when the Greeks got hold of it, when the Germans got hold of it, the French got hold of it, they found a way to extract the female out of it. And, you know, even when they say uh, God, you know, here you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, where's the woman in that? Now, when they first got it, Aset was there. You had Osar, Aset, and Heru. But they said, how can we find a way to get the woman out of the thing so it's more in alignment with the worldview of one thing is good, the opposite is evil? If you look at Christian sanity, the fall of man, original sin, uh, you know, all of that fundamental alienation is due to Eve, right? The woman, you know, Delilah, all of these things are based on that idea of, you know, what's good is male, what's evil is female, what's good is white, what's bad is black, what's, you know, good is mind, what's bad is the body. So, you know, you find different variations on this all throughout Eurasian thought and their Eurasian worldview. And once we're speaking their languages, once we are dealing with their conceptualization of reality, which is a falsification of reality and manipulation of imagery, that's where we get conceptually incarcerated, what my father would call conceptual lockdown, right? It's like you've gone into 24-7 lockdown. You can't see the sun. You can't exercise. You're literally just stuck in this concept of, when someone says God, he, 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 he. So, you know, it, it really stifles our worldview. It stifles our view of reality. And it really, really puts us in the hands of our enemies in terms of once they can get you to conceive that one thing is good and the opposite is evil. Now, every single thing else that you think about is through that type of lens where you're trying to see, okay, well, white is good, black is evil. So what does that make me as a black person? All right, you know, I want to have Mary had a little lamb whose sheep was white as snow, or I want to have a white Jesus, or I want to have, you know, white, white, white. Now, that's not a universal concept, because when you go to the Song Hoi language, anytime they want to use an adjective for something good, they use the term BB, which translates to black. <coughs> Excuse me. And that term BB, you find it still in the Akan language to this day, and it means the exact same thing. Where you say, O BB ni, a BB mine, a BB drew. You say BDA, that all of that comes from that same root of black. But in the Akan language, no longer is used as an adjective to mean everything good. Now, because we've, we're on the coast and we've been exposed to the Eurasian worldview, we'll see something black as something bad, you know, just like, you know, white people do. Uh, we'll say Okra Brifo, someone who has a black Kra, and the Kra is an aspect of the self that also would translate to spirit, perhaps, that comes from the supreme being. But to say you have a black Kra is, to, is supposed to be a bad thing. 
Meanwhile, in the Songhua language, I have the exact same word, bibi. When they want to say that something is powerful, they use the adjective bibi to describe it. They'll say wane bibi. If they want to say that the water is pure, they'll say hari bibi, which is to say black water. They'll say, I know hari bibi, give me black water. If they want to, you know, talk about anything like uh, the soil is fertile, even if the color isn't black, they'll say, this is sadiza bibi. That's to say, this is black soil. That's the way that they say that is good, it's fertile. And you can find it, you know, just across the board. You find a similar concept in classical Kemet, where even the name itself translates to land of black people. And the idea of chem itself, that's also the root of the word chemistry, is that which is complete, that which is perfect. And everyone aspired to become Asar in the afterlife, where they were, and he was known as uh, the black one, the great black one, you understand? Or Kemet, which was the by name of Aset, and she also had the idea of completion, perfection. The idea is that once you pass on, if you're able to say the 42 declarations, then you yourself would also be called Asar, and then you yourself would be regarded as the great black one. You understand? So again, that's not a universal thing. Lots of people think it is, and they only think it is because all they speak is English, and therefore that's the conceptual lockdown that we're talking about.